I know that some of you were, maybe most of you were School of Architecture, or possibly. Is that, uh, how, how true is that for, for you all? Design school? Design yeah. or, yeah, or in a design, I guess, design architecture program. Yeah, we're Is there anyone that's not? Anyone that's yeah. in some other field? No, no. <laughs> I'm history. You're history? Yeah. <laughs> you're more in public policy. Foreign policy? No, public policy. Public policy, okay, great, thank you very much. Um, and and so there, that, in its own right, could offer a couple of biases. We could be heavily focused on design as solution or prototype, sort of the graphic design leads to font or leads to whatever, or architectural design leads to space and, and uh, adjacencies and daylight and physical structures and um, design of, in history in the sense of trying to, I mean, the very act of writing history is actually redesigning the truth, right? Because whoever writes the history, you know, in the 1800s, none of us were part of that truth. And now all of us have a blog, so the very construct of history is an interesting design question. Um, certainly in terms of policy and the, what the word social means is a lever for people engaging what are the problems or questions we ought to serve. And so formally, social policy has always been a fairly pragmatic, very small set of people got to pragmatically make decisions that may or may not have the effect we want. But now we live in a world where everybody can put their shoulder against some social you know, question, and then policy is playing catch up on some level. Um, you know, in, in Turkey and Istanbul right now, I mean, we have you know, what looked like a park being an issue is now becoming a national strike. And that's in three days' time. And, and so how do you write policy for that likelihood as opposed to, you know, what we can predict? So um, where should we spend time in terms of our biases? Because design can be capital D and sort of Aristotelian and capital let's do grand design and, you know, sort of be proud of the icons we build. Or it can be lowercase scrappy, sleeves rolled up. I don't want it to be perfect. I just want to be in the sandbox. Um, it can be a mindset, like pedagogy or curriculum or sort of an attitude. It can be very elite, and only designers get to design, whether they're doing t-shirts or they're doing opera houses. So, um, And then, of course, this is about human stuff. It's about the future of something, future of human engagement. And, um, and I have my own you know, skin in that game. But what would be interesting, at least as a starting point, like somebody throw an atom into the room, and then something else is going to bang because of that. So um, before I do anything formally, what would be interesting to you to explore as far as why design matters, what design might mean in 2030 when your career is really hitting its stride, and um, why you should actually complete your degree. Should <laughs> Well, no, I mean, we're, we live in an age where no longer does the degree guarantee you anything. And that's not a, a, a frightening thing. That means we have to develop different agility. Um, and we are the winners of the previous system, and probably because you're in uni, you are the winners of whatever system got you here but all of a sudden the gas clutch is looking very different. Like your degree will have less and less value over time, so how you create value for the teams and organizations and you know, communities and networks you be in is going to become less and less about that paper, and then rationalizing the cost of that paper is going to be increasingly more challenging as well. So when you imagine your children going to uni, next generation is going to find that an option, not necessarily we succeeded. So what would be interesting to you all, and then I'll give a little context about my firm and, and what we do and sort of the very serendipitous way I stumbled into this world because I wasn't trained for any of this. I was uh, trained for something very, very different. Does anybody have an opinion? Because I'm, I'm not the only one in this room that has you know, something that can push us. Um, I guess as a designer, um, should we be looking for uh, specific solutions or flexible kind of um, uh, paradigms or whatever? Yeah. Um, when I, in the part where I share, but where my brain goes is this idea of are we designing for a solution that is perfect, is the result of all that hard work, are we designing for more the beta pilot prototype, like staying in a state of designing and kind of seeing the, whatever the object is is actually in a state of evolution, right, continual iteration. So that's kind of where my gut goes, yeah. but don't let me get away with that if that mm -hmm. ends up not being interesting to you. So that, that for me would be an interesting thing. Like, what else would be worthwhile? If you were my students in my class, I absolutely wouldn't let you get away with this. One. You'd, be standing up, you'd be standing up, we'd be singing a song. I, 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 you know, I, I wouldn't let you get away with your question. I'd ask you about your question. And so you're getting away with this because we're in the embassy and I'm supposed to be polite. But <laughs> clearly, don't be polite on our account. Clearly, somebody, right? You didn't show up because you know this is the only option you had. So what's possible? Interesting to hear a little bit more about co-design, participatory design okay. as well, and sure. the concept of empathy in design. So. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, and, and the firm we just teamed up with the last three days, um, 
working with the city council in Wellington, and, and uh, we worked with uh, 20, 20 to 25 high school students, give or take, um, spending three days in a design boot camp solving a problem or taking on a problem we're solving in the city. And the firm that we teamed up with actually called them. So their design studio is called Empathy because they've decided they're going all in, not on the prototype and the solution and the post-it notes or the sketch or the renderings. They're going all in on that first phase, which is, are we capable of listening, listening boldly? Are we capable of, of understanding the human condition before we even imagine the problem? Um, so the empathy, and then in that participatory design, design thinking, and even with that, there's a lot of high academic, you know, sort of finger crunching about is one better than the other, and everybody wants to own a piece of that pie, when in real truth it's just an attitude. Um, but that would be great. So we'll kind of talk about the idea of designing something complete, and then designing more in the spirit, and then that would be good. Anything else? And of course we can deviate it along the way. Is there anything else that I can support you? Yeah. Um, just from what uh, I've seen of your work, which is in a huge amount, of, you're doing mostly physical stuff. Do you have any opinions on digital as a medium, and how these ideas apply to it? Um, yeah, so where my, where my imagination goes there is we have begun as a team, um, and I'll use this in a, as a segue to kind of creating context about, about our team. Um, we are shifting from saying we are architects designing buildings to we are creating environment, uh, ecologies that have the capacity for X, which means you have to design not only the physical place, but you think about this as drywall or gym construction, which means this sucker can be torn down in about a day and this wall can be moved in here, and that's called flexibility, but you couldn't do it. The maintenance team could do that, right? And the security detail, probably. So we're trying to imagine on one hand, this is very physical, and once we have boundaries, even though this is a black box theater, this is really a black box theater. It's not, it was a library, and now it's a media, and it's a TV studio, and all of a sudden has this. But really, it's a, the construct is black box theater. It has to be 27 things, depending upon the speed of the request. But we have to think in the same way of user interface in the digital realm. We have to think in terms of the not so much there isn't a boundary, because there very clearly are boundaries, like our brain. We haven't lived in a world where Ray Kurzweil, the great futurist, says the singularity is here, where man and machine are combined. Um, we aren't there. There is still this jarring split between the physical, which is really just our atoms making sense of physical, and the digital, or the sort of ethereal, if you would. But we have to be able to design all and. So the difference is we can design this as a computer lab, which means it's a physical space that, quote unquote, has computers in it or we design this space as a world-class platform for operating in analog, analog and digital simultaneously. And so, in essence, that realm is, can we take on the bigger question, which is, if all technology digital was ubiquitous, what questions would you begin to ask now? What, what experiences would you foster? So, um, that'll be some place that, as we go forward, I'd be interested in hearing your opinion about that as well. So, we'll, we'll tease it up. And the truth is, neither one of us know the answer, but we'll, we'll fake it for everybody else. Um, so, uh, my name is Christian, and uh, I work for a, forgive me if you know any of this, um, work for a global A&E firm, architecture and engineering practice. Uh, we have about 1,200 designers around the world, which in the architecture realm is pretty big. There are firms that are in the closing on 10,000, um, but most firms in this day and age are boutique, or they're kind of in that 100 to 400 range. Um, and it's almost impossible to imagine an architecture firm that has 25 to 75 people anymore because the economics no longer allow that to be the case globally. Since 2007, architecture firms are going out of business left and right because the conditions will not allow them to thrive. So we live in an age where um, in the U.S., and I know this is true globally, the unemployment rate for just out of school architects to be is 13%. Other than being trained to be a doctor, which you have to have a medical license and to be a lawyer, which you also have to have, you know, not only a JD, but you have to sort of pass the bar. Architecture is sort of that other in engineering. Like, if that building falls down, not only do you go to business, you can go to jail. Like, there's a moral responsibility to that building not collapsing. Um, and so taking those exam after exam after exam to finally be able to stamp a drawing and sign your name, it means you're now liable. It doesn't mean you're frankly right. It means you're now li liable in a court of law for the premise that you can make a construction document turn into a building that won't hurt somebody. We live in a day and age where um, architecture firms are finding very, very hard on high liability, small margin. So if the building goes down, everybody's gonna sue us, so to speak. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. On some level, there's culpability. And oh, by the way, you're not paid for being creative, you're paid for construction documents. 
your only currency in the market is will those construction documents be purchased by your client and then are used as currency for the construction team or the, the construction management. So while d architects have always been perceived to be the great renaissance man or woman, the Beaux-Arts sort of tradition, right? You sort of have a cape and you flow in and <laughs> since you were five you've been doodling tree houses and all that stuff. The market of architecture doesn't care and, and I say that not to be a cynic, I say that because there's a remarkable opportunity and that is the generation of architects who are your elders have not figured out how to position themselves as designers solving really remarkable problems. So they give away design as marketing, or they give away design as sort of the artifice of, I have the right glasses, and I have a studio that looks really profound, and a Herman Miller chair here, and, and I'm of course being cheeky just to do this. Mm -hmm. But what they haven't figured out is how to price point creativity. What they haven't figured out to do is to put a value on that as, as a social exchange. So this new generation of architects, or those who will play in that realm, have a remarkable opportunity to not only work at that low margin, high liability level, but to flip that and to say, how can we create high margin, very low liability? So how can we be a designer uh, at lots of scales simultaneously? And how can we use design not to prove that we're the architect, but we can use design in order to be part of a network or community putting their shoulder behind something and architecture may be a piece of that. Um, so we work in a firm that over the last 70 years has become one of the most recognized in terms of, um, of architecture, engineering, and construction. Um, and in healthcare and education, we're in, ranked in the top five or 10 in the world at any given rating at any given time. So I'm very, very proud to be a tiny part of a firm that over 70 years has positioned itself to be seen that way. And there's a lot of wisdom, expertise, and history that says we've earned that. What the firm has been doing over the last couple of years is says the future's not going to want that. It's not going to care. So how are we going to create the new conditions for us to thrive? Um, because all that can be outsourced. All that can be done by somebody else at a lesser price point and willing to do it three in the morning while we're sleeping. And, and to a degree, architecture is the easy part. And that's true of anything. Teaching history is the easy part. Inspiring somebody to think like a historian is where the game is at, right? And developing policy, for instance, is the easy part because we sort of know how to create the white papers, we know how to sort of gather people around a table and on and on and on do the research. The hard part is knowing that it will make a profound impact. And I think with architecture, there's something similar. The buildings are the easy part, even though it's awe-inspiring that any of them are built and that you will do many of them. Um, the hard part is what's the relevance of a designer going forward. Um, so in Canon Design, we've basically said we're no longer a firm of, of architects and engineers. We happen to have 900 of them. But what we are is a firm of designers trying to take on the world's greatest challenges. So we're looking at the future of healthcare, not what should the hospital look like. We're looking at the future of learning, not should the classroom be X number of meters you know, by square. Um, we're looking at not urban planning, but what is the story of the urban context in the future. So IBM is actually designing cities right now. Pause. IBM designs cities because they design the ones and zeros that become the digital fabric of the urban context. So 10 years ago, the only one that designed the cities were city planners, urban planners, folks in political situations that would be able to put infrastructure and whatever together, and real estate developers are trying to spec it and all that stuff. And occasionally you had somebody that designed Washington, D.C. as a perfect sort of expression of elegance and manhood and I don't know. And others like Boston, were horse trails that were paved over after a while. So there's no rhyme or reason to this street being this street because that's where the horses went. And then there was a bay and then they filled it with a bunch of stuff just like you know, the volcano where the airport is not too far away. It's a place that wasn't the place. So in this day and age to design a city no longer is where do the streets go and do we have digital fiber running under the land and, and where will the demographic shift over here and where's the city hall go? Now the game is how do we understand the capacity of the off-the-grid economies in Mumbai, in Mexico City, Shanghai? 50% of the economies are not formally on the grid. And so how can we learn from those human conditions not to feel sorry, but actually to go the most organic coral reef structure of entrepreneurism or an off-the-grid economies in Sao Paulo and, 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 and wherever. It's not in the places where people like us have the elegance to go, what if we did this and put the business sector here and the airports here and we can get a spreadsheet that says it'll all work out and we'll win. We're having to rethink those questions about all of it. So our firm has basically said, 
for us to even exist in 10 or 50 years, we can't approach this as architecture and engineering. We have to approach this as what are the, what are the human conditions by which we want to create capacity. And our transition game is to certainly merge architecture with uh, investment banking, with um, uh, developing sort of political fortitude. Um, it used to be, why aren't there more architects like Thomas Jefferson running for public office? If only an architect could, you know, who became a US president, if an architect could run for office, finally we would have design minds where it mattered. But that's not acceptable anymore. It's not enough for the architects to save the world and be renaissance and sort of be the smart ones because the problems are bigger than any one profession. But now it's a matter of can we realize that none of us know how we're going to push back against these massive forces and how do these tiny little a Twitter stream that comes out of Cairo that looks like a rounding error suddenly is a revolution that now historians and people like us are saying, see, we saw it coming. But there was a day and a half before where nobody saw it coming. And so how do we as designers or human beings or policymakers or investors or you know anybody who has any skin in that game, how do we begin to go, I'm sort of sensing the gestalt, the constellation, I'm sensing the conditions. So when I enter that equation, how do I begin to not think of the solution, but think of a portfolio of scenarios? Right? So part of it is I could design the object and then force the human beings to use it. Design the investment strategy, design the park, design the school, design the whatever, and obligate you through logic to pick my side or the other side, right? And then move you here because it's logical. All the best enlightened brains in the world have said this works as opposed to can we create a range of scenarios that make it more and more likely that we'll triangulate towards? And can we play off those emerging patterns, not just try to lock in one that we can defend? So as a designer, it's becoming more and more uh, pressing on us that we begin to not be smart when we enter the room, but madly curious. We have to be the least expert in the room and the most curious. Because if you're curious, you're willing to team up. If you're curious, you want to know. You don't say, well, yes, but. Interesting idea, but let me tell you what, I, what it really is. It's more like, I have a great idea, but tell me more about yours. Um, so being in a position where intellectually architects or any expert would have believed they were in the room because they had the sort of grand unification theory, instead it's you want to be the dumbest at the table with the brightest crayon in the box. Like You want to be able to go what's possible. Um, somebody said to me this week, um, they were a professor in the School of Architecture and we were talking about lots of things, and they said, I'm no longer interested in what somebody knows, I want to know what they don't know and I want them to be in love with that. I want them, I want my students to know what they don't know and go all in. Because they're much more interesting than my colleagues who believe they got it figured out. And, and that's interesting. Um, so we are a firm that shifted from we're A&E, architecture engineering, and that's why we're in the room. Here's our portfolio of buildings, which we have many that we're very proud of. Um, two, the only way we'll be relevant is we have to become something we've never trained for. And so that now means, um, so I'm a non-architect, so one of the ways you do that is you hire people that have no skill in that, to spike the punch, right? You bring in people who, who don't see the hammer and therefore everything's a nail kind of thing, or the vellum and therefore everything's draftable. Like, um, I don't even know if you draft anymore. <laughs> it's, if it's not read, it doesn't exist. Um, so um, we, uh, I joined the firm um, because uh, the gentleman who oversees our K-12, uh, uh, K-12, which means kindergarten through, but it's little people through high school and, and university, um, heads our global design team in that realm. Um, and he wrote, he, he didn't write, but he's the point person for the book, The Third Teacher, which sort of became the impetus for could we launch a studio within a big global entity? Could we create a SEAL team using sort of milita American military lexicon, a small team that goes off the edge of the boat in the middle of the night under cover of darkness and completes a mission and then gets back on and nobody even knew they put on a wetsuit? So we wanted to create a SEAL team within our global entity that could be highly experimental without the entire ship getting off course. So in a lot of companies like Xerox in the 70s, they had parked the ARC that was the skunk works for, I for Xerox. Um, Google has their own skunk works, and Coke has its own skunk works, and most entities in this day and age that have to play at an international level have some kind of skunk works or R&D team or little black ops team over the side that is allowed to do whatever they want. Um, in Facebook, uh, it's a bunch of graphic designers that do screen printing. 
and they took over a part of one of the big warehouses one day and said, we're just opening up an analog studio for, they called it the Facebook Analog Studio for Research and Acts, and all it was was, grad, was screen printing. But now it's actually infiltrated, infiltrated culture because now engineers are now coming to them and saying, I want to create the conditions where people can not have a final answer, but can think about the prototype and the beta, which at Google is actually all they ever do is beta at Google. So third teacher plus was this idea of not, we're architects who design schools and we deserve credit for that, and we wrote a book, so therefore here's the menu, and please hire us because this solution is the one you want. And we, all of our research says this one's better than yours, so hire us. The book was instead of what we know, it's here are the questions we're curious about. So the book was framed as, is there, and that's the key part, is there a relationship between teaching and learning and the built environment? Now for an, and this is before I came, I had no credit for this, for an architecture firm to actually ask that question, is there, as opposed to, what if every building was a 3D textbook? What if the flagpole was a sundial and every kid sat around there like Stonehenge and tried to imagine the passing of time and there's Aristotle thinking about the sun and couldn't we build that and no kid or teacher will ever use that flagpole as a 3D textbook? But from a design standpoint, we can argue it in the marketing materials. It was a shift from there is and here's our version, which is expertise, to we're madly curious and maybe there isn't. It isn't that we're doing any harm, but maybe we're overreaching our column line. Um, so we teamed up with Sir Ken Robinson. We teamed up with Howard Gardner, who is the one who gets credit for multiple intelligences as I'm a kinesthetic learner, or I'm an auditory learner, and that kind of rethinking about kids and how they learn as human beings. Um, teamed up with Rafi, an international musician who works with kids. Um, teamed up with uh, cooks creating organic gardens that you know become lifeblood of communities. Teamed up with lots of people, technology and sustainability. And basically said, is there a relationship between context, setting, and teaching and learning. And as architects, not do we have the answer, but are we willing to go on that path? And the third teacher comes from an Italian school model um, called Reggio Emilia, which is a lot like Montessori, if you know Montessori as an education model. Reggio Emilia believes that, that um, in essence, there are three teachers in life. The first teacher are the adults in your life, the second are your peers, and the third is the context, the environment, the adjacencies, the physical space. The way that chair feels on you is affecting not only your posture, but also your comfort, which means your systems are reacting and you might be more or less tense than you're aware of, so you're reacting. And the sense of constraint, and if you had to drag that chair, that on this carpet is, these are great replaceable tile squares, but that chair and this carpet were not designed to work nice together, so we can't actually code switch this room really quickly because it's at that pressure point of that chair bottom, those four legs on the carpet, and the fact that you haven't been given permission to move your environment. So we were curious about that. So the third teacher is, in essence, let's spend the next millennia thinking about that as a starting point. So we launched a studio called the Third Teacher Plus, which is a really fancy way of saying we think the future of teaching and learning is a design question. And we're agnostic to material form. So this could be a film. We could design a film. We could design user interface in an app. In an app. We could design experience professional development. We could sit down with futurists and investment bankers and try to figure out how will we put the conditions for a billion dollars of economic weight against something. We could build something called a school that has a front door. So Canon Design explicitly builds, buildings called, and their teacher plus says, what are the contexts by which we will think and learn and collaborate together? And some of it has spatial implications. So we sort of play between those tensions. And then beyond that, um, there's a lot of other stuff that I can share with you or later on can send links if it's of value or frankly you can all Google so you probably can do a much better job of searching it out. So um, in there were some hints about the what you asked and there were a few hints you said there and I'm overdoing the policy thing so thank you for allowing me to have sort of somebody in the audience I can, I can use some of the language. Um, so that's a good stopping point for my voice. Um, where should we go with that now? I'm happy to be the recipient, or I'm happy to get you to talk to. So, what, so what sort of problems does it <coughs> have in the world? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to give credit to two of our other teams to give you context, because I just think it's wicked what they're doing. Um, and if we do our job right, we'll team up with them. So we have a cities group that designed cities from scratch and reimagined cities that exist. So they're in Mongolia right now designing a city for 5 million people, and right now there are essentially yak herders. This, I don't mean to, to minimize the importance of the culture that's there, but from a sheer scale, there are thousands of people, and we're designing a city for five million. Um, 
and they want it to be an academic city. So they're not adding a university. They're not trying to make it a great academic city. They want the very city, its DNA, to be the future of academia in Mongolia, which is both contextual to Mongolia, but also it's a new pivot point in terms of Asia being the center of higher ed. Right? Not just Beijing and Shanghai, but, but the entire landscape. Um, so that's interesting because I don't know how anybody, let alone a team, designs an entire city. Right? We also live in a day and age where, um, how many of you saw the skyscraper in China that went up in a matter of days, not a matter of years? Did you see the video? Yeah, right? Prefabs. Yeah, literally, it's an entire skyscraper as a prefab and built in days. Right? So we live in a day and age where something that would have taken you know, the cathedral makers of a previous century or three, the grandfather as an 18-year-old would have started laying stone. The grandson, as a 70-year-old, would have died on site, and the cathedral like Sagrada Familia would still be being built. Right? Part of that's because of the masonry, and part of that the craftsmanship, and the fact that they couldn't ship it from overseas. However, that's the construct by which we imagine the work we do to solve the problem, and then how long it takes for the problem to be you know, fully realized or the solution. Now we live in a day and age where the entire set of components of a skyscraper, we're talking 40 to 80 stories, we're not talking a little condominium project of eight stories. We're talking something that's going to make the sun have to go around it. Right? We're talking about all of the components can be built in a factory, shipped to site, raised up, locked in. So it's no longer the crane is built inside the building, and that's interesting. It's the entire skyscraper was pre-built and then just brought to site. Part of that is architectural. A lot of that is what are the social policies, what's the economic policies, does the union labor have the right to actually oppose that rapid construction? Will people die on site? Will the building be <coughs> safe in 50 years? I mean, there's a lot of ethical questions that go in, but we live in a day and age where time is no longer the boundary, and building it on site brick by brick, so to speak, is no longer um, in Shanghai, the world's tallest building, which will complete in the next year, give or take. 15 years ago was a rice paddy. The entire side of the river that the world's tallest building which is surrounded by buildings that are between 40 and 110 stories, surrounded, was a rice paddy less than two decades ago. I've got a good question yeah. about that. So here in New Zealand, people talk about mana, right? The, the worth, the value, what you bring to, culturally, what you bring to the society or the community that you're in. Mm -hmm. That cathedral that was built over two, 200 years was the investment of the collective value worth of probably an entire community sure. or maybe even an entire yeah, nation. Yeah, absolutely. And that skyscraper, which was built in a matter of days, certainly probably was a lot more expensive, uh, probably from a design point of view, much more challenging. Um, but I'd be interested in your thought on kind of the worth that that has to society within this cultural context. The emotional sure. attachment. Yeah, so the like emotional. I mean, sure, sure, sure. Um, so let me take it down to a very human level, the craftsman. Let's take it to where it really starts, and that is some woman or man is sitting at the kitchen table and has been trained to be a person of craft. Right? They, they have been, they're carrying a tradition forward. Um, and if we go back a couple of generations, in most developed nations, craftsmen and women were at the center of all of these discussions. Right? You didn't have to be licensed to be an architect. You were a craftsman of drafting or craftsman of surveying or craftsman of you know, swing in the mallet. You were a craftsman of design. And then all of a sudden licensure came in, right? The ability to find the commodity of that. And in several generations, we went from millennia of craftspeople doing work that was tied to community. So the work we did was tied to the very pulse of our family, or tied to the pulse of the river. And, you know, so the Maori wouldn't stand out. They would have been proof positive of what the world did, um, so to speak. Um, so now we live in a day and age, and this is true in terms of education too. You didn't go to school 200 years ago, except a few Germans who went to pre-cadaver school called university, and a few other people who were privileged to go to boarding school because they were the groomed next whatever. But the vast majority of people went to relationships where a craftsperson mentored them, and they were in a guild. So if we think about that question in terms of this day and age, the question that comes to mind is what will the guild and the crafts, craft X be in the future? how will the, the environment of being able to be a person of craft 
as opposed to just a part of the machinery. Um, regardless of modernity, regardless of production, regardless of technology, regardless of things being able to be 3D printing. I mean, 3D printing, forget everything else. If we just wrestle with 3D printing, that means the entire content of manufacturing has just been flipped overnight because it's been democratized. But it also means if you don't, ac you don't have access to material, the chemical compounds that you can put through the machine and make your widget, it's irrelevant. So we live in a day and age where the crafts, the question of craft and culture and producing something that is either easy to, to, to sell or give away, or it is transformative because it truly is of, okay, um, is a really interesting moment. Um, and so education, to go back to the kind of question of architecture and something, the traditional, over you know, the last you know, 70 years, 100 years in most modern developed countries was on some version of a mass literacy, assembly line, get everybody to be a citizen that can respond in a certain way, have a shared language and currency and ability to answer A, B, C, or D so that we can further progress. And now we live in a day and age where we're getting close to maxing out that model. And now people are starting to say, I want to both at the most humble analog level be a craftsperson, but I also want to live in this explosive, extraordinary flowing of atoms and ideas and digital bits. Um, so to me, the question is, when we talk about the craft of a task a generation from now, um, and we aren't caught up in the objects, you know, mixing board technology, the iPad, the cloud-based computing, the camera-based intuitive connect gesture thing, and we don't worry about big data and big brother, but we just imagine the basic human condition of, do I have worth? And can my worth be exhibited? Can I make manifest my worth? Can I make something? Um, and at the same time, can I make a very small piece of a larger whole together? Because that, to me, is what we don't know. Um, we have a pretty good vision about, from a business, political, tactical, we can sort of see the next couple of years to maybe decade and a half. But we are assuming a couple things. That the trajectory continues. That everybody wants to be more and more and more of an expert. And that getting smarter and smarter and smarter is the way forward. Um, and whether or not those conditions will be true. So I'm, I, I'm really curious about that. I have a f six and a four-year-old. For instance, uh, I don't think either one of them would believe college is their first choice when they're 18. I think that the, the, the moral question of should they be in debt in their 50s just in order to have a job that can be taken away six months later, uh, it makes it very difficult for me. My wife and I both went to Harvard. We're clearly the winners of whatever system we worked our tails off. We also were born lucky. And we have been able to leverage all of it, and we could give it all up tomorrow and start over. Neither one of us believes our six and four year old will go to college at 18. And my wife runs one of the elite middle private schools in America, and I design schools around the world. And, and we had an interesting conversation about how to position our young people. Um, it looks different. And I think it's striking that balance of how can we be human within this digital fabric, or how can we be human within this economic fabric, how can we be human in this sort of global plate tectonics. Um, and I think craft is going to be one of these interesting words. The guild as opposed to the diploma. Um, World of Warcraft and Burning Man and Ted are much more powerful agents today than I work for company A, B, or C. Right? I mean, the, uh, the, the deconstruction of the university. I went to this university. I went to Victoria University. You know, at some point pretty soon, somebody will say, really, you did all of it in one place? <laughs> interesting. Wow, they must really have something incredible for you to do that. Um, as opposed to, I leveraged multiple organizations and experiences and networks and tribes to not just get a degree, but to actually be of value. And so that idea of craft within a discipline of architecture or education or, or whatnot, and also this idea of I need, I need resources that make me a player. I don't need permission to start. And that's also going to be interesting. And, and I don't know what it looks like after 20 or 30 years, but the scenario suggests it doesn't look like this. And that the most privileged will have, still have access, but many of the most privileged are actually backing out of it. Uh, have you heard of the Teal Fellowship? Teal Fellowship? You heard of PayPal? I don't know if PayPal is the dominant, one of the dominant currency exchanges digitally, but certainly the US PayPal is kind of like how you pay for things if you don't just want to hand over your credit card, right? Um, 
One of the three founders of PayPal's last name is Teal, started a fellowship. Uh, we're now in our third year of the Teal Fellowship, I think, um, that made one promise to college students. If you drop out of college, I will give you $100,000 US to start something that will fail. And I'll mentor you. <laughs> right? First of all, there was, unless you had a really wild patron who wanted you to live on his estate, there's never really that sort of like, are you kidding me? And his expectation was, and this is three years ago, that students who were not thriving in university would seek that out. Right? The sort of C minus to B plus kind of student who is making it through but maybe not getting all the uh, claim would say, you'll give me $100,000 to not feel in pain? <laughs> and tell mom and dad that I don't have to stay here and you'll pay me more than I'll make in my first three years combined? Right? <laughs> right, right, right. I, want, I want that, by the way. Yes, sir? I was just going to say, you've hit, a get, hit up against something um, quite important in New Zealand, I find. But I've worked in the public sector in a summer job, and risk aversion is a really big problem, yeah, especially huge. in New Zealand, because yeah. we have these really strong yeah. constraints. So it yeah. sounds like you, you're a product of a huge economy where you sit at the top and you've got this freedom to do all this wonderful stuff. But in New Zealand, like, we've got yeah. very restricted uh, sort of economic power, and there's only so much people, yeah. especially designing policy, can really expect to you, you, are, you can't really go to your superiors yeah. and say, oh, this is such a great innovative idea, and then expect something to actually happen. Sure, sure, sure. Um, in there is a, is a 10 hour conversation in many directions, yeah. and, and yes. Yes to what you're posing, and yes to what the questions are. Um, I'm only offering these as trend lines, not as covering every option. Um, here's what I would say, and I mean this very, very politely really smart people are world class at saying yes, but. We are trained in education and in nuances of organizations and the higher we go up to get even better at saying, yeah, but, right? We do that really well. From a design world, one of the great gifts of the design world is and, and, or yes, and. So regardless if it's true in a context, is it plausible over time? Regardless of context, is it plausible? And if so, how would we design for those conditions, right? If you are in Saudi Arabia, I and mean, you spend a great deal of time in the Middle East, and you ask somebody to be entrepreneurial, you know what happens when their first business goes out of business? They write their family from prison. So whatever constraints you have in New Zealand are a rounding error in comparison <laughs> to the Middle East. So your constraint is in the top 1% of constraints. Um, and I only say that because it's relative. But if we imagine that within the Kiwi context, culture, there is an extraordinary realm of innovation as opposed to getting the Kiwis to do it this way, and we try to treat it as an and-and proposition, how do we create the capacity for which Kiwis can innovate within the historical context of being true and authentic as a Kiwi, but also realize that those boundaries are going away and that the tribal boundaries are becoming much more powerful than the geographic boundaries. Um, that the micro cultures are becoming much more powerful than the national culture. That a young person who dresses like a business person also has tattoos up her arm and now belongs to multiple tribes simultaneously. And we look at the aggregate possibility of culture, community, individuality, etc. And we simply say and and to a premise as opposed to I don't know. Um, so going back to the teal thing, and this is not to say you're wrong, it's just in, in polite, it's, it's we got to push against each other. Yep. we got to be, you're absolutely no, right. No, I'm not saying you're wrong, I was just challenging you. No, it's a, it's a great challenge because <laughs> when we go to Turkey and we're asked to design a model school for the entire country, like in theory, our firm has been asked to design the future of every school in Turkey. It's not about being a good architect. It's about empathy. It's about anthropologists on your team deploying to figure out what is. Not being smart enough to deploy the solution, drop it in. Um, so the first person on our team hired was an anthropologist. Because being a smart architect or educator isn't what's going to be the hard part, and that's not even what's needed. The Teal Fellowship, I'll go back to it, made one promise. If you drop out, the people that responded, the vast majority of first year applicants were in the Ivy Leagues, Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Stanford. The best in theory, the winners of the system were willing to drop out for $100,000 in capital. By the way, a graduate of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, who's not making 100000 in their first four years because they chose not to, right? It's just, it's just, that's not the problem. Salary's not the problem. So the question is, why would really, really smart people 
who are on an express train to whether there's the tall poppy or not tall poppy in whatever culture, they're on an express train to realizing what's, what they've been training for. Why are they willing suddenly to exit to be part of something that's more ambiguous? And that to me is really interesting is the ambiguity. So in your question, it's what we're curious about is where's the ambiguity in the question as opposed to the either or. In that question about culture, it's where the productive tensions. So it's not this culture versus that culture, it's where the productive tension is, where the two plates rub between one you know, Silicon Valley versus Wellington, right? Um, and to a degree that Hegel, the great you know, German philosopher, or you could say the worst philosopher, it doesn't matter, this idea of thesis, which is my argument, my supposition, and antithesis, which is exactly the opposite. I'm going to counter your chess move with another pawn, right? And that's what we do a lot, but Hegel always believed that what those do is when they chemically collide, they create synthesis, something that was cannot happen without that collision and you can't undo that synthesis. So it's kind of like you burn up a tree, the ash, you can't make tree again. So to a degree as a designer, getting everything back to being the moral and strategic opportunity for a designer, is how do you, A, have immense empathy for the possible questions that could arise? How do you live comfortably in the ambiguity, which has a lot to do with risk? Are you willing to fail fast, not guarantee success, right? And are you willing to fail honorably, not just because you're creative and have somebody's money to burn? Um, and then when we look at the conditions, not is there a solution, but is there a scenario, a, is there a spectrum of plausible scenarios? Is, are there conditions by which we can respond to, not react to? Um, and I think going back to, again, architecture, which is the predominant sort of bias in the room, it's not can we solve the problem, we assume we can but are we solving the problem we're solving? Or are we listening to the right things? Or are we sensitive to that balance between risk adverse? And we gotta do it anyway. New Zealand is a culture of pioneers. Those who weren't indigenous. It's a culture of, of people who had to create it in their own. It couldn't be handed to them. It wasn't there 5,000 years ago, you know, the way it was in Rome, right? So the non-indigenous Kiwis, so to speak, had to be, had to be entrepreneurs. They also look very strongly to the UK, though. So what's that? They they also look very strongly to the United Kingdom and Britain. So you know, no question about it. No question about it. So all of these are interwoven. I mean, they're they're tapestries, and you can't pull a thread and get it figured out. Um, so to me, the curiosity, the empathy, and understanding that that I, I love your phrase, risk averse, that ability to understand where that fulcrum is. Um, and also, it's not necessarily our, your, mine, our ability to be risk averse or to be all in and innovative. It's are the prevailing, is the gestalt of the community at a tipping point? Can you create conditions that aren't the full answer, but start to create movement towards? Um, you run a TEDx event. So a TEDx event could be a design, a design that begins to shift Wellington's intellectual, cultural, economic community towards a certain exploration of ideas worth sharing, so to speak, in the brand. It could also just be a one-off that nobody takes seriously because, yeah, you know, we, we in Wellington, eh, that's interesting, we'll do it for a day, but that's not really who we are, right? So it's all true. Um, and I think as architecture designers, professionals, um, we live in a world where it's no longer either or. We live in a world where the capacity is, is much more diverse. And, and then beyond that, now I'm just talking like at three in the morning in a hallway of somebody's apartment. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. Sorry, I know you came to talk about third teacher and another time, um, but if you just go back, I'm just interested in you as a first teacher with your six or four year old, um, and how they're not going to go to university when they're 18. Yeah. What do you do with them sure. to sure. <laughs> um, help them? Uh, yeah, and this is a very micro one person and, and his even smarter wife thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, and it also admits that we have the ability to opt out and opt in. Mm -hmm. So, you know. I don't say that casually, right? Um, but I'm much more interested in a six-year-old spending the next 14 years developing a portfolio of mentors in areas that he is really, really interested in than in whether or not he got an A or a B in his sophomore year of high school and that applies to the right college. I would much rather have my daughter, who's four, get to the moment where college is an option and to say to a university, tell me why we ought to partner because I have options. 
um, I can go to uni in five years. I, I, I would love my children to come to me and say, I've got a business proposal for you. Would you invest in this for a certain year, and here's my business plan? And even if it's partly me finding myself and partly me trying to raise a little money, and partly me not knowing what I'm doing because I'm 18 and I don't really know, but I would rather go through that cycle so that once the stakes are higher, a company invests in me, I have a diploma, I have to decide what it's worth, I have to decide what my moral compass is mm -hmm. in a community or in a family or whatever. Um, 